Don Newlin? Be what? Don Newlin? No, John Newlin. And now, John Newland takes you one step beyond. Come. You'll witness things strange, unexpected, mysterious, but not to be denied. Join me now and take one step beyond. Hello, welcome to the Ascent of Mount Carmel YouTube channel. Today we're discussing the eighth chapter of the first book of Ascent of Mount Carmel written by St. John of the Cross. You're about to see the rarest kind of human experience. You may question, you may challenge what follows. The theme of this chapter is that desires blind and darken the soul. There's nothing that I could possibly tell you that would prepare you for its fantastic end. You may believe it or not. Desires blind us in the same way that fog restricts our vision. In the same way how a cloudy mirror can't give us a clear image or how a muddy river doesn't offer us any reflection. Souls that are clouded by desires are darkened in their understanding of the ways of God. They are impeded in clear thinking and can't see the light of supernatural light that would otherwise allow them to become illuminated. Scripture says, My sins overtake me so that I can no longer see. When the understanding in our souls is darkened, our will and our resolves become weaker. If there's anything more to it than this, we'll have to look further. In an earlier video, we discussed fasting. Many people who fast seem to experience clearer thought. This is because they are purifying themselves and purging themselves of the desires for creatures which darken their souls. So when understanding is darkened and impeded, our souls become disordered and troubled. Well, those are the facts. Scripture says, My soul too is shuddering greatly, which is to say, the soul is shuddering because it is blinded by its faculties. Not to be denied. When souls are darkened and blinded, our understanding has no more ability to receive enlightenment than our eyes can see in the middle of the night. When we are darkened, when our souls are darkened, we no longer have the desire to embrace God in pure love. We don't appreciate the importance of it or the need of it. Desire binds and darkens the soul because desire is blind. Desire is like a animal-like behavior with no understanding in itself. When our desires lead us, it's like a feral animal that is trying to lead around a blind man. It is as if a blind emotion is leading the blind. The point of this entire chapter is that whenever the soul is guided by desire, it becomes blind. Scripture tells us that if a blind person leads a blind person, both will fall into a pit. It was blind, leading the blind, with my baby and I drank wine. The eyes of a moss aren't of much use to it because its desire for the light of a porch light dazzles it so much that it ends up just getting burned. A person who feeds upon his base desires is just like a fish that's just attracted to the bright lures of a fisherman. Those lures beckon the fish to its doom. We are the same way when we are attracted to the bright neon lights of worldly attachments. Well, what do you think? Even if we think we can see, we believe that we see correctly, but we're seeing incorrectly, what good is that? Nothing. Apparent perception of an external object not actually present. This is what desire does to the soul. It's enkindling its lust and dazzling it and confusing its understanding so that it isn't even capable of seeing the light of God. You won't find anything about it in the ordinary book. The soul becomes confused because it sees a different type of light. It's not the light of God, but the neon lights of desire. When the soul meets this worldly light and is attracted by it and is satisfied by it, it's incapable of progressing toward any growth. It can't do so unless that dazzling power of desire, those neon lights, are taken away. You're a believer, aren't you? St. John of the Cross points out that some men practice extraordinary devotion 
and many other voluntary practices, and they think that this is going to be enough to bring them to some sort of ecstasy or divine union. According to St. John of the Cross, this simply cannot happen unless they also work at mortifying their desires. If they would do this, they would progress more in one month than they would profit from all their other practices over several years. A farmer's field will only bear weeds unless he puts in the work to plow and sow his seed. In the same way, no progress can be made until the difficult work of mortifying our desires is made. According to St. John of the Cross, even if a person makes a great deal of effort in trying to become holy, all that effort will yield no more success than if the farmer tried to sow a seed on unplowed ground. The darkness and rudeness of the soil will not be taken from it until the desires are cast aside. Desires are like cataracts that obstruct the sight until they are removed. We deprive ourselves of great blessing of divine light because our blindness stemming from our affections and desires. Yes? These desires hurt us and create evils within us if we don't mortify them. We simply can't indulge our desires and believe that we won't be blinded and darkened by them. I hope you remember the last chapter we discussed how Samson's desires for women led him to torment. In this chapter, St. John appoints the Solomon and his desires for women, and even Solomon, who had been given the great gift of wisdom, allowed his wisdom to be blinded by his desires for women. Scripture says, When Solomon was old, his wives had turned his heart to follow other gods, and his heart was not entirely with the Lord his God. Rather than making his soul a fitting altar for God, as we discussed we must do in the previous installment, Solomon's blindness caused them to make actual altars to pagan gods. So if unmortified desires could bring so much blindness to a man so wise as Solomon, how much more harmful would they be to you and me? Scared? Even without clouding our vision and judgment, we have very limited understanding compared to God. Scripture says, The great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who cannot know their right hand from their left. Every time we hold evil to be good and good to be evil, we do so because of our blinded judgment. When truth is called a lie, the light go out, darkness falls and indeed. If your light is dark, how very deep will the darkness be? We compound things by adding our own obstinacy to our natural darkness. It's like a domino effect. Once our judgment is clouded from sin, we just fall further and further into degradation, and we don't even notice it. How much more frightening? Or how really terrifying? Regarding those who love to follow their desires, Scripture says, We look for light, but there is darkness for brightness. And we walk in gloom. Like those who are blind, we grope along the wall. Like people without eyes, we feel our way. We stumble at midnight, as if it was at twilight. When we are blinded by desire, we can look right past what is true, wholesome, and good, and not even see what it is. It's though we are blinded in darkness. We've had a brief encounter with the world of the unknown. Next week, and every week, we'll be bringing you the personal records of the rarest kind of human experience. Man's adventure in the world of the unknown, beyond our five senses. This is your invitation to take with us that astonishing one step beyond.